Hello everyone, this is LaVoy Finnicum, one Cowboy Stand for Freedom. Um, this is a very important video that I'm making. I'm hoping that you can have a, a little bit of patience as I try to do a little bit of educating. I'm, count, I'm calling this part one, LaVoy versus BLM. I'm here on my ranch and uh, it's beautiful out here. And it's time that we do something more than just talk about freedom and about defending our constitution. So I want to educate, I want to teach, I want to let you know what I'm personally doing to defend our constitution. First off, I'm going to just pan here and show you where what this pasture is. This is just a uh, one of my pastures on my ranch. I don't know how many acres are here, three, four thousand acres in this particular pasture. In six years, I've never grazed this pasture off. This is the first year that I'm turning out on this pasture. And that's going to be significant, and I'll explain why. But first, I'm just going to pan and show you this pasture. Okay, as you look around, this is my reservoir. I call this my upper camp pasture. A few of my cows sitting on the reservoir. And the range goes to those tree lines, those mountains over there and it continues to go down to those tree lines that way looking south um, goes to those tree lines there and then from there this pasture goes to the that mountain right there my ranch also goes up on top of that mountain but this particular pasture is just this this valley here and uh, daughter come back over here and this is the best part of my ranch. This is my daughter, Catriel. Um, she's my second to the youngest. And she helps me with all of this with the rest of my family. But my pasture goes up that way uh, several miles. Um, again, a lot of acreage here. Never have grazed this off in six years. If you look, see the grass? Look how thick it is. Look how green it is. And, and we're in late summer. Late summer. And um, so this is this is my my pasture here, and this is part of my ranch. This grass I own it. It's called my grazing rights, my forage rights. And uh, these cows are fat and sassy and looking good. And I've got a few more of my cows down under some trees down there. Uh, I'm not very good with technology, but they're down there. And um, and um, so let me move forward here. Put this back down. Hope you can see me. And this is my my dog over here, Diamond Hill. Hill, um, great cow dog. She's she's pregnant right now. Going to be her last litter. She's getting a little old, kind of like me. Um, a year ago, she uh, she and I both got laid up. Um, she got stepped on by a bull and um, bull got her and broke her all the bones in her back leg and so she's never really been quite the same but she loves being out here with me and my family and the cows she she loves it out here I had a colt come over on top of me about the same time and we we're both uh, feeling kind of old and broken up for a while but it's good out here life's good out here now the reason I'm making the video and this isn't about cows, this isn't about grass. It's not even about my dog. But it is about my family, and it is about freedom, and it is about the Constitution. I've never been crosswise with Bill M. in all the years that I've owned my ranch here. Never had a trespass filed against me. I've never been over what they call the AUMs, which means how many cows I should run. Like I said, I've never run for six years in this very pasture here. The point is, they claim that this is theirs, and I claim that the, the forage right, the grass, is mine. And so let's go to the Constitution, our supreme law of the land. And this is the point, this is the rub, and this is the focus. In Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, and let me start by, uh, by going back and laying down the intent of our founding fathers and the intent of the Constitution. Our father, founding fathers came 
out of tyranny. And they were really concerned that this land be a land of freedom. So they did several things. One of the first things they did when they laid out the Constitution was they, they divided the powers into three branches. And we all know what those are. The executive, the legislative, and the judicial. So we have three branches of power. So they separated those. And the other thing they did to keep from having a centralization of power into a, a, a central government, which increases or decreases the freedom of the individual, is that they limited the amount of land mass that this central power could control, called the federal government. Because if you can control the land, you can control the food production, you can control the people. Now, currently, the BLM, or the federal government, lays claim to one-third of the land mass of the United States. Put that in perspective. You've got to put together the, the country of Germany, and you must combine it with the country of France, and then you better, better put in Italy, uh, Spain, throw in Portugal, and then throw in, in Britain. You got to start throwing all those countries together to begin to get them close to, to the comparison of the land mass that the federal government owns, say that they own and control. Now, and in this land mass, they claim to have what's called exclusive legislative ability. And what they have done, they have combined all three branches of power. And I'll explain that. You, you have bureaucrats that sit behind desks and they will write a statute or a regulation and it has the effect of law and then they implement that and now that regulation is, is enforced by federal rangers um, who are armed and they can enforce it, ha they're empowered to enforce it by lethal means if necessary. If a person gets it crosswise with one of these statutes, they're then hauled into a federal court and tried by a federal judge. All three branches of power combined under one head. Now, none of these people, do we the people here over whom this is imposed upon, have the power of recall. In other words, we don't elect them. They are not accountable to us. And so, our founding fathers knew that that was a potential of combining great, uh, great power under one head. So they limited, by the letter of the law, what land that the federal government could control. And it's found in, in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. Let me read it to you. I've shared this before, but let me read it to you again. It says, referring to the federal government, it says, to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever, in such districts not to exceed 10 square miles as may by secession of a particular state and the acceptance of Congress. What is that, that 10 square miles? Well, that's, that's Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., the, the seat of the federal government. That's proper and that's appropriate. They go on. It says, to become the seat of the government of the United States and to exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be for the erections of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other such needful buildings. Okay, they limit the federal government to purchase only those lands needful for the defense of our country. Docks, arsenals, forts, and other such needful buildings. And not only that, they have, they can't take it by eminent domain. They must ask the state legislatures if they can purchase it from them. So in this very clause here, by that very sentence there, it acknowledges that the states are the owners of the land. And what happened was that, that in the beginning, these states, when it's, oh, there's one other place that the federal government can exercise um, control over in landmass, and that's territories, and that's appropriate. It's in the Constitution, they have that right. And so when a territory was to be admitted to the Union, they were to come in on equal footing as the original 13 colonies. And so they were not to be less than. 
And so at the moment, at the time of statehood, those lands were to be disposed of to the people of that state. And if you look on a map, you can see that that procedure was followed until you start getting out here west. And as time lapses, as governments are wont to do, they, they like to hold on to power, hold on to wealth. And so they became slower and slower at disposing this land to the people as they are supposed to do. Until, at such point, they become almost, they almost quit. And then they did. And then they says, you know what, this land is ours. And, and they said that uh, we own it. And let me give you a little history on this. I hope you'll follow along with me a little bit here because it, it's important to understand this. And it's important to understand so that you can understand who is lawful and who is unlawful. Well, let's go, let's go to... Um, um, Let's actually go to what I'm particularly involved in here, and it's called grazing rights. Now, grazing right is a right that is established by prior appropriation. Um, it, is, it is a natural right, and um, preemptive, a preemptive or prior appropriation is the legal term. And that's how property rights are established, and it's called common law or natural law. Um, for example, I explain this to people to help them to understand this. We understand um, rights when we look at lines. See, lines, rights are not granted by the government, but a person claims right. There's three things to, to, to establish a property right. The first thing is you must claim it. The second thing is you must use it. And the third thing is you must defend it. And I'll do, I'll do a quick analogy so you can, you can get the gist of this. Okay. We all know about lines. We stand at lines at the grocery store. We stand at lines at the DMV. We stand in lines at uh, um, the movie theater. Okay. When you stand in line, you create a right. Um, it's self-evident. That's where our founding fathers men. Certain rights are self-evident. In other words, I'm the first from the line at theater. I have established that by prior appropriation. And, and so that is claimed. I claimed it. And as long as I stand there, I'm using it. I'm not giving it up. And so I'm using it. So I claim it. I use it. Now the third thing is I must defend it. Well, let's go back to use it. I cannot, after I, I make this claim, walk away because it's taking too long. And I go get a hamburger and a drink and then come back and the line is really long. And say, hey, I'm first in line. You know what happened? I lost that right because I didn't use it. Okay. Now... Suppose I'm sitting there first in line and the line is long and in comes a bigger, bigger feller and he says, man, that line is too long. And so he steps in front of me and uh, I can do one or two things. I can say, I can mumble and complain and step back. And in such case, I have given up my right. Or I can defend that right. Those are the two things. Well, what has happened, the federal government has come in and started claiming it. We have been here prior, prior to, you know, prior to the BLM being formed. These grazing rights were established. And I'll explain it to you. This particular grazing right right here that we're sitting on, all this green grass, all this acreage here. Okay, I bought this grazing right from the ranching family by the name of Ballards. Ballards bought it from the ranching family called the Heatons. Okay, the Heatons were some of the first settlers in this, this country here. There was nobody grazing out here. There wasn't Indians out here grazing on this. There was nobody grazing here. They come out here and, and, and they create a reservoir or they take a spring. They develop. They come with a, a little herd and they say, you know what? Man, there's good grass. I got some water. I am going to claim this as my forage right, my, my grazing right. And so they did. And they used it. And then in would come another another rancher with some herds, and they'd make them a reservoir over here or develop a spring over there, and, and they would run. And sometimes we ran in common. You know, we'd, we'd have good waters, and they say, okay, I'm going to run 100 head, you run 100 head, and it's called running in common. And, you know, eventually as time passed, we put fence lines on all the borders of these grazing rights. And, uh, and when we had conflict, the bigger guy come in and says, you know what, I know you're here first, but, but I'm tough, and I... 
I'm going to take. And, and so sometimes we, we fought and we shot each other over these, these grazing rights. Down in the central Arizona, there's a big old basin as you drop off the muggy on rim called the Bloody Basin. So we establish things through blood, sweat, and tears. These grazing rights are natural rights. They exist sole and separate from any written law. The Constitution doesn't even give us these rights. We have the Constitution because we have these rights. And so here we are, sitting on these grazing rights, ranching it, and along comes the BLM, 1935, 1936, around there. And they look around and they say, you know what? We now pass the Taylor Grazing Act, and all these grazing rights now belong to us. And we have exclusive legislative ability over all these grazing rights. And we'll let, we will now permit you, we'll permit you to graze on these. Here we're going to give you a permit. And we will re-examine every 10 years if we want you here. And in fact, anytime in between those 10 years, if we don't want you here, and we'll change it anytime we want, anytime we choose through our wisdom and our prerogative. And you know, as, as ranchers, we, we kind of got bullied. We kind of, we were negligent. We were uninformed. And as they grew, and they came in very softly, very kindly, very nice to help. They didn't come in with a heavy hand. The government never does when they come to take our freedoms. It's always to help us, always to, to take care of us. And they come in softly. Well, that's what they did. And they've continued to move forward. And so now they're claiming that this is all theirs. And so one third of the land mass, they claim that they have exclusive legislative power over. No representation. That is not America. That is not in the intent of our Constitution. And it is not in the letter of the law. So this is the question. Who is the lawbreaker and who is the law abider? You know, I stood with Clive and Bundy, my friend, and his family, in helping them to get their cows back over this very issue. And you know, I've never been one to, to try to cause problems. I didn't get in trouble in school. I always raised my hand. I always stood in line. I, to this day, I do not have a speeding ticket. <laughs> um, so it's not in my nature to go out and poke my, my finger in people's eyes. But there's a time when we need to come and stand up for the Constitution. It is being eviscerated. It is eviscerated. We have lost it. Where does it exist? It only exists in the hearts of about 50 million Americans that understand it and have the, the fire of freedom burning in their breast, who's willing to stand up. And so many people, you know, good people, what can we do? We've been voting. We, we've been donating money. And, and the candidates always promised to, to, to stand up for freedom. Well, what did we do? We, we gave the, the Republican Party the House and the Senate. What have they done? Nothing, nothing. And you think we're going to give them a Republican president and they're going to stand up on the Constitution and they're going to, to require the federal government to live within the, the frameworks that we the people have given them, namely the Constitution? It's not going to happen. But this is where it will happen. Because this Constitution will be saved. The principles vouchsafed herein will prevail. And this is me doing my little part. So what I've done, I sent a letter to the BLM saying thank you so much for your help in managing my ranch, but I shall no longer need your help. I shall manage it myself. And so I will no longer pay them the mandatory fees, nor the mandatory, sign the mandatory terms and conditions, because they're illegal, illegitimate. It's not theirs. I didn't buy it from them. I bought it from the Ballards, Ballards from the Heatons, Heatons established it. Okay, it's not theirs, it never was theirs. They're forbidden from having it. Okay, so let's make that clear. The first thing, if you're going to stand for freedom, you better figure out where the line is. Who's legal, who's lawful. Now, this is the first time that I am going crosswise with the Bill M. I've told them that this grazing right is mine. For six years, I've not been able to graze off this green pasture, three, four thousand acres. It might even be more than that. I don't even know. And, and so now I've got water in my reservoir. 
My cows need some pasture. And they say, well, you can't turn in here. We've signed it. We've got it. We've got a regulation on a piece of paper. You, Lavoy Finicum, cannot turn in here on this grass. We don't care that you've not grazed this off in six years. But we have on this regulation, on this piece of paper, that you cannot turn in here until October 15th. Well, by October 15th, my water in this reservoir may be dry. It probably will be dry. Then how will I graze off all this grass that is mine, that I pay for, that, that I fight every year to make my mortgage, mortgage payment on? Everything I have is tied up into this. My home, my life. I spent my lifetime trying to obtain a ranch to, to live like, you know, I loved as a, as, a, as a young boy riding with my dad, chasing some cows on the weekend and stuff. And I always wanted to raise my family out here and raise them like this. So I'm putting everything on the line, my home, my dreams, my ranch. But I'm telling the, the BLM right now, I'm saying to you, this isn't yours. It's mine. Leave me alone. I'm bringing in my few measly little cows, and while I've got water in this reservoir, I'm grazing it off. Well, I was very kind and polite as I talked to them. Sent them a very cordial letter, and so I get a call last week. Oh boy, are you, are you going to turn in there? I saw some cows there. Yes, Mr. Range Con, I told you that that I that I'm not recognizing you as the the owner of the land. I didn't buy it from you. I'm not. I'm not paying you, you know. It's it's not, it's not yours. My mortgage isn't isn't to you, BLM. And so, and I didn't buy it from you. I bought it from the Ballards. It never, never was yours. And so, yes, Mr. Rangecon, I'm turning in my cows here. It's grass. It's green. I, I'm turning in. It is. It is August, August, uh, middle of August. So I'm August, September. I'm turning in about eight, nine weeks early. I said, well, we're going to have to trespass you. We're going to have to start documenting. I got to make this. I got to account to my, to my supervisors. Well, I, I understand that. Go ahead and do what you want. Uh, this isn't anything personal against you. It's just not yours. It's mine. So here I am. I'm beginning to document me as this individual standing for the Constitution. Now, there's a lot of talking, a lot of poking holes in the air with the fingers very little doing when it comes to standing for our Constitution. Oh, if we'll just donate to the right candidate, if we'll just donate more to the Republican Party, or we'll get a Republican there in the White House, and surely, surely, it's going to all be better. And that's crazy. That's crazy. Washington is not going to vote away power. For a hundred years, it's taken a hundred years to gather in this landmass and to seal it down. They have complete control over um, one third of our country, America, one third of our country. And these federal rangers that run around here, they're armed, military style. They got their M4s, they got their tack vests, they got their, their bulletproof vest. You know, you saw them down there at Bun Bundyville or Bunkerville. You saw them pointing their guns at us. They promised to shoot us. Dan Love, you're one of the head of them. You're the, you're the, you're the point of the spear. You're the enforcement arm of this. You know, you're not a good guy. There's no way you're a good guy. Nowhere do you have authority to run around here with policing powers. Nowhere do you, do we the people give you authority by force, by lethal means if necessary, to enforce these regulations on these pieces of paper. You know, what are you going to do, Dan? You and the FBI. There's my few little cows right down there under that tree there. You gonna come in here like you did with my friend Cliven and say, we're taking these out and you better not get in our way? Well, I'm telling you, leave me alone. Leave me alone, leave Cliven alone. There's some tough ranching families up there in Utah. Stanton Gleaves by name. Now you have three. Mr. Federal Government, that's willing to stand for the Constitution. It's the ancient law of witnesses. You have a witness in Nevada, Clive and Bundy. You have a witness in Arizona, Lavoy Finicum. And you have a witness in Utah, Stanton Gleaves. We have three ranchers 
that are going to stand and defy you. It's not yours. And, uh, you know, breaking the law right now just by saying this. Just by saying this, it's what's called conspiracy to commit crime. And that's what you guys hauled that, that county commissioner into, to prison, into court with, Phil Lyman, and you convicted him. And he's going to face a, a, a year in prison, possibly, and one hundred to $300,000 in fines. Because it's the very thing that I am saying right now. I don't care. You know, if you go to the Bible, there's actually a, a story I really love. You might be familiar with it. It's called... Uh, the, the captives that were in, uh, in Babylon by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Three. Three. Anyway, the greatest force upon the face of the earth at that time was the Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man in the world. And anyway, he knows Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're out there, and, and they, they make a golden image, and they command everybody to fall down and worship the golden image. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they don't fall down. They don't worship them. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar gets a little upset, but he knows him. He calls him up there and says, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, if you'll just sign these mandatory terms and conditions and pay your grazing fees, it's going to be okay. We can work, you know, and I'll, I'll, the music will play again. You just fall down. Worship the golden image, and it will be okay. And I love the response. He says, because, Nebuchadnezzar goes on, and says, because who can save you? Because if you don't, I will throw you in the fiery furnace. And what God can save you from the fiery furnace? And I love the answer. It's great. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replies, says, Oh, king, we are not careful to answer thee. In other words, saying, you know, we're not going to measure our words. We're not going to be tepid. We're not going to be timid. You know, they're speaking to the greatest power in the world this time. These three captives should say, O king, we're not careful to answer thee. Our God whom we serve will deliver us. But if not, be it known unto thee, we will not sign those mandatory terms and conditions. We will not pay those grazing fees. And if we, and he will save us. And if not, if not, so be it. But we will not bow. We will not comply. We will not bend. America, stand. If you want to know what you can do, here you go. Stand. I'll let you know what's going on. I'll keep updating you. I want you to download this so it doesn't get scrubbed from off the internet. Then share it. Upload it. Send it out. And you can follow me here. You can follow me here. You can follow Stanton Gleaves and, and Clive and Bundy. Here I am, and I'll document this as it goes forward. They've called me, said, okay, we're going to have to start doing something. Well, we'll see what the next step is. Maybe they'll just leave me alone. I hope they do, because it's not theirs. Stanton Gleaves has some county commissioners with some grit and some county sheriffs up there. He ranches in five different counties, and those county sheriffs are standing up against him. Bill M. says to, to Stanton Gleaves up there, you can't turn out here in these pastures. And Stanton Gleaves says, yes, I'm going to turn out in these pastures. And the county commissioners and the sheriff stand up behind them. Proper form of government. Government closest to the people. Those county sheriffs are elected by those people. Those county commissioners are accountable to those people. They have the power of recall. And anyway, they back them down. Now, I've talked to my county sheriff here. I'm going to go visit with him more. He's been very friendly in, over the phone. I'm going to visit with him, shake his hand, take the measure of the man. See how deep his love is for the Constitution. See about his understanding. But whether he backs me or not, I'm going to stand. But he said some very kind things. The BLM tried to get him to give resources, the Mojave County Sheriff Department, man and power and stuff, to, to move against Clive and, um, here recently and told him no way. So good for him. We shall see how it goes. America, stand. The night is far spent. Constitution has been shredded, but it lives in your heart. You know what freedom is and what freedom isn't. Stand, because when you stand, others will stand with you. And God can't stand with you if you don't stand. Once you stand, you can expect the hand of providence to be over you. No matter how it ends, it matters how you stand. This is Lavoy Finicum, One Cowboy Stands for Freedom. 
See you later.